In this interview, Ian Richards speaks with Senior Minister and Minister of Labor, the Honorable Vance Amory, about government's efforts to enhance the working environment and the state of industrial relations within St. Kitts and Nevis. The Senior Minister touches on efforts to establish a labor code, the functioning of the National Tripartite Committee, and more. It's important for us as the Ministry of Labor and myself as Minister of Labor to ensure that we as government through the Ministry of Labor, to the Department of Labor, which the Commission of Labor heads, that we continue dialogue with the private sector, with the representatives of workers, that's the unions, to enlist their support and their cooperation in ensuring that they understand their particular positions as it relates to the law and it relates one to the other so that we minimize any of the negatives between and among the, the partners, the employees and the employers. Our job in the Ministry of Labor is to so engage both parties, all parties, so that they have a clear understanding of what their, their, their law says in respect of their behaviors, in respect of their rights and their responsibilities so that we minimize, if not totally eliminate, any tension in the workplace and establish the harmony which we require. Right, and in doing so, um, there is a strategy to make it more active, to make the departments and the staff members more interactive, engaging with managers engaging with employees as well. And so there's been basically an increase in the number of staff there. Can you tell us about that? Because from what I understand, it's more than 100% increase. Well, it, it is. And the reason for that is we thought, I thought, and I said, let me say we thought that the staff which we had at the department in 2015 was inadequate to undertake the work which we are mandated by law to do. One, we have to deal with persons making claims. We have to deal with other issues where you have um, uh, conflicts between and among workers and between workers and employers. So we, I, we, I don't think we had the, 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 the number of staff members to do that. We also wanted to see the department and the ministry as being more proactive. We get out to the workplaces, we get out to the building sites, we get out to the retail stores, to the groceries, to the bakeries, whatever um, the workplace was, where people are engaged in, in giving their labor, working to ensure that the conditions under which they work was satisfactory, conducive to providing and producing good quality work. And it, it was only it was necessary for us to find or to encourage and ask the Human Resources Department and the Ministry of Finance yeah. to see the, and I'll say the wisdom of that, because if we are able to visit all the places of work, if we are able to engage in training and interaction with workers, in training and interaction with employers, we think they will have a better understanding and therefore keep the, the harmony which will benefit them all. It will benefit the employer because he will now know that he has, that the workers are being made to understand their role, mm -hmm. their function, and, and get a country which is more productive. That really is the objective. Right, efficiency certainly producing one that would benefit both parties. Now, Minister, talk to us about the staff itself now because it wasn't just a matter of recruiting persons and sending them in the field. Training is an important part. They have to be trained in the law. Well, you're quite right, um, um, Ian, and that we have focused on training. We have gotten some persons who have never worked in the, in the, in some have never worked in the public service. Some have worked in other um, sectors of the government, but not specifically in the Ministry of Labor, Department of Labor. Our policy has been to see training and bringing the skills level and the understanding of the laws relating to labor relations um, to a point where every member within the Ministry of Labor, Department of Labor specifically, has a better understanding of what the laws say. 
Uh, and once they are equipped with that, they're better able to interface with the persons in the workplace, whether they're employers or employees. You, you made a very interesting point, and that is we want our employees or staff in the Department of Labor, in the Ministry of Labor, to understand that they're, to, they're there to serve the people, and they must serve with professionalism, they must serve with courtesy, they must serve where necessary with the compassion, which, because people have complaints, you have to understand and, and be empathetic to, with them. I've, I've said to them, when we had our staff meeting at the beginning of the, of the year, and I think it's the second Monday or so of, of January. I had, we had a meeting of the full staff, Permanent Secretary, the Labour Commissioner, Deputy Labour Commissioner, all the heads of units, where we met to discuss the strategies we'll be using during the course of the year. And one of the things which I try to share with them is that they have to be, in a way, totally representative of the government and whatever they do with anyone who comes into those offices, they must do it with the utmost politeness, the utmost professionalism. And one thing I emphasize is that they must first of all learn to listen. I have discussed with them also the objective of if they're going out into the field, they go there first and foremost to listen, to observe, and then to let the people indicate what are the areas of difficulties so that they can then address them. I've also, in terms of the training which I, I, we are instituting, indicated that the, where they are unable, anyone is unable to deal with a particular matter within the office, it does not hurt to refer the matter to a senior officer, to a labor commissioner, for guidance. It is something which I feel is absolutely necessary. It's not to say, I can't help you. It is, I will find an answer. Give me a moment, or I'll call you back. I will speak to the commissioner or some other senior person and have an answer for you. This is what we are doing in our training and in our guidance for all the, the employees, the, the staff at the Ministry of, of Labor. But the training is not just on national labor laws, but also international conventions, international laws, certainly things that think it's any sort of signed on to. Very important. Yeah, well, it's important because we are... Uh, we have signed on to the ILO conventions, not all of the conventions but, or protocols, but we have signed on to some which are very important, like um, child labor, um, trafficking in, 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 you know, in, in, in persons, mm -hmm. um, health and safety, and, and all those things are important areas of the world of work and the, the, the labor market conditions. So we, we want to ensure that all the staff, even though there is an ILO desk, an ILO officer, I've said to the permanent secretary that I would like to see more than one person trained in all, in all the areas, that we do not have any gaps, that if the officer who is in charge of the department is absent, there must be somebody there in the ministry, in the department, who can fit in so that we don't have people coming back. But we cross-train, we multiple-train, so that everybody has a broad view of what is required of the department and of them as public servants, civil servants, serving the public, no matter what the, 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 the issues may be, uh, which come to that department. And you've also made it easier, sir, in terms of the staff getting out there and going to interface with the employers and with the employees by acquiring a bus for the department. Well, you know, it is. Uh, we thank the Ministry of Finance and the Prime Minister for the budget to have budgeted for it. And we have acquired it. We got it commissioned last week. And it is to enable the staff not to find any excuses to go to a workplace, to, so to visit, to interface with the, with, with, the, with the employers, the managers, the supervisors in the store, those who work there as employees. It, it is for that purpose that we have been seeking the, the, the funding 
from the budget of a bus for the department. And we are happy. Uh, and I feel the staff are happy as well. And it will mean that to travel, say, all the way to, to a project like in Hildons, mm -hmm. in the in the St. Paul's area, all the way out there, nobody has to worry about that. The What will happen is that the, the, the department head, the commissioner, and the department head, in which, in, which, which is responsible for the site visits, can work out their schedule so that we get the most out of the use of this vehicle. We've hired a driver because we wanted someone who is dedicated to utilizing the bus. And we have set in place a very strict operations procedure mm -hmm. so that he, he and if a, if, God, if a lady comes, then she will also know what has to be done in respect of the performance or how the, this week is managed. We think that week can last for 10 plus years easily if it is properly managed. Right. Now, the interaction that takes place between the government persons, the persons who represent the employers and who represents the employees take place at various work sites, um, at various businesses, but also on a more formal level. And that is called a National Tripartite Committee. Explain to us, for the benefit of those who may not be aware, what the committee is and what its function is. The, the National Tripartite Committee, which is um, founded in, in, in law, is a representative body made up of representatives of the government, representative of the private sector, that is the business community, the chamber, industry and commerce, and representatives from the labor unions or from the unions, representatives from the unions. We have in St. Kitts the St. Kitts and Nevis Trades and Labor Unions um, active. We have the teachers union. And what we did in establishing this um, tripartite committee, national tripartite committee, that is three parts, government, the private sector, business sector, and the representative of, of, of workers, that's the unions, was in the, for the unions, we have reps from the trades and labor union. Now we have a rep from the teachers union because we didn't want to select anyone and make that one just the blanket um, representative of workers. From the um, the St. Kitts Industry of Commerce, trade, uh, the Chamber of Chamber. Industry and Commerce, right. they recommended their persons. The government, we have the chairman of the committee is the Labour Commissioner, and we have other persons from the government working there together in harmony. The objective is to establish what we set out when you asked the first question, to ensure that there is understanding, that there is harmony. Because I think with with harmony, let me not talk with with harmony, we can achieve much more. At least it reduces all of the conflicts, quote unquote strikes, sit downs, all those things. We want to to see those as things of the past. As we continue to get fair fairness in the workplace, as we continue to get the the kind of environment which is conducive for people. And we get people to get fair, decent wage for decent work. That is what we are, we are after by using this tripartite. How would you say the meetings have been going? I do not attend the meetings myself, but I certainly get reports from the to the permanent secretary about the meetings. And the last meeting held last the meeting held last week, I was advised was very cordial and progressive, moving towards um, the goals which we have established, and that is to modernize the labor laws or the, and, and get a labor code, a modern labor code for St. Kitts and Nevis in accordance and in line with what the ILO prescribes and would like to see, but also to satisfy the specific needs of the, the, the labor market here. The employers must have a fair deal in any construction of the law, so too must the employees and the government, but also see that we are satisfied that we can, in fact, implement it and that we can monitor it so that the, the, the labor market in St. Kitts and Levis is one 
which is harmonious and which gets the most in terms of the output productivity and the compensation, not just the output, but the compensation of workers on the other side. The other. You hinted at the labor code earlier, so tell us about what exactly the labor code is and how is it expected to impact the work environment here in St. Kitts and Nevis? The labor code, when it is um, done, would be a consolidation of all the bits of legislation which have been there, like workers' compensation, dealing with them, holiday, you know, the different pieces of legislation which are there, which we want now to bring into one piece of legislation. It's, it's, it's take, it has taken some time because nine years ago there was an effort made to or, or efforts made to commence the creation of the Labour Code. The Labour Code would be that modern piece of legislation looking at all the pieces that are there discussed between and among the government under the, the, the legal department, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce representing the workers, the unions representing the workers, will discuss all of the matters which they would like to see enshrined in the new labor code to guide and manage the way in which labor and empl employers and employees function in the marketplace. With, and the object is to make sure it is fair for all but it still allows for the, well, the government then will be the, the mediator, the arbiter, right. using that bit of legislation so that we keep that balance in the workplace. Right, and of course with the laws, basically, with government, their role is basically impartial. Like you said, arbiter. It's not on the side of the workers, not on the side of the businesses, arbiter. And this is what I've tried to impress on the staff of the Labour Department and Labour Ministry. Because you, you get comments being made, oh, you know, don't worry with the Department of Labour Commission, or oh, they're they are taking his side of, of this side or that side. I've said to them at every turn, the law is what guides you. You don't have an opinion in this matter. You read the law, whatever, the law which exists there now, if it says that someone has to be given notice in writing three times before the person is dismissed and that is not done, then the person who has dismissed Mr. So-and-so has infected the law. You don't, you, you don't get into whether the person was rude or whatever it is. What the law says is that the person against whom the infraction has occurred must do X, Y, and Z. If somebody, however, steals, you, there's no warning. It is grounds for immediate dismissal, so you don't have a, an opinion in the matter. You're, the job of the Labour Department and the Ministry of Labour is to just deal with the law. And where we feel we have a difficulty in the interpretation, the matter is referred to the Attorney General's Chambers for guidance based on the law. Right? Another thing I've said, we are saying to them very, 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 very clearly is that when you go out to, I mean, you have to deal with a particular case. Mm -hmm. You listen and you document everything. Everything is written and you hear both sides before you even make a report. And that report then forms the basis of action. I said, if we have any doubts in terms of the, the application of the law, the Attorney General's office, an officer from there, is required or we submit it to them and then they will give the guidance in terms of the law. Now the Labour Code, there was a, num a national symposium basically that took place in November. It actually was called the National Conference on Labour. Mm -hmm. That was held in um, November 2017. And there were stakeholders from all across St. Kitts and Nevis who would have made their inputs. Can you tell us a bit about some of the outcomes of that National Conference and also how has it, based on the outcomes, the suggestions that they made, how has that impacted the work plan of the Department of Labor, the Ministry of Labor, moving forward in 2018? Well, it's always good as a, to have the dialogue. And that national you know, conference on labor was to get the views 
of all of the stakeholders. And I should mention it was the first time it was ever held. It was the first time and we we want to make it an annual event and we want to make it, to broaden it if there are people from other countries who want to come to participate because we will involve the ILO, we will involve the the um, the Caribbean Congress of Labour, you know, those kinds of things. We will involve, you know, international trades and labour unions, those kinds of persons uh, because we want to make it so broad so that our staff becomes more acquainted with how officers working in the Department of Labor and how the ministries of labor should function, always in service to the people. One, using the law as a basis. The other aspect, a uh, thing which has, which has helped, I think that con convention uh, or conference was the, uh, opened up the eyes of people to a number of things. I think the, the, the exposure which the staff got I think made them recognize that they are each and all of them important mm -hmm. in the scheme of things and they are not just there as a recipient of complaints and to process severance or long service gratuity. It means more than that because uh, I said it is to educate them but also to educate the general populace involved in labor matters whether you are uh, chamber of Industry and Commerce rep or member of a business owner or you are a provider of, of labor as an employee or as a company providing that service to, to, to another company. We need them to understand that and the conference was geared for that purpose. Right. And some of the recommendations they would have made, how, is, how have they been moved forward in the, um, in the work plan of the ministry? Well, in terms of what we do, we, the training Mm -hmm. Clearly, is one of those outcomes. Um, attitudinal change is another of those outcomes which we have working on. I think I spoke to you, I told you initially that when we met, I tried to look at attitudinal change because right. I have come to realize in my years as a public servant and as a person in politics or administration that attitude of persons in the workplace. Attitude of persons in society generally is critical. If you have a bad attitude, then everything goes, goes haywire. But a positive attitude can make the world of difference in resolving um, um, differences, in providing solutions, and also making the workplace much more pleasant, and also making the, the business more productive and more profitable. And I've, I've argued uh, when we had a, a, a symposium on productivity organized by the, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, mm -hmm. and they invited us to participate. I've, I've argued that if we are able to make the business more productive and more profitable, then the option, opportunity for the business to pay to reward the workers who make the profit a bit, to, to reward them a bit more would be possible. But if the business stagnates because productivity is low, there's no positive coming, no promotion of the business and things like this, then increase in wages and salaries would be very difficult because if you pay more for your operational costs but your profit is dwindling, then the business will soon go into into a bankruptcy right. and we want to prevent that uh, at the launch of the work plan for 2018 um, at the Zion Raven Church um, of Sunday um, there was mention of the role of the Ministry of Labor in contributing to the socio-economic development of St. Kitts and Nevis. What plans do the Ministry have in creating jobs these opportunities for young persons so, to become gainfully employed? Well, the, the truth is the ministry does not itself create jobs. Right. What we do is we seek to educate young people or people generally on what is required for them to become employable to get a job. So wherever we engage in training, whether it is for a business corporation or just generally, we invite persons to participate, or whether it's true, or if we're doing a a exhibition 
we have material there which speaks to people about what you need to do to become gainfully employed. You need to be qualified, you need to have a skill. If you don't have the academic um, capacity or academic qualification, you can have a practical certificate, practical certificate, TVET or whatever it is. So we encourage that kind of approach for more people generally. We work closely, the department works very closely with the Ministry of Education because there is a correlation there. We have to make sure that the Ministry of Education through its different um, departments is providing the quality employee or the quality entrepreneur which is required for the country to grow and for the economy and socio-economic development to take place. The Department of Labor, however, has adopted and made itself the repository of the jobs which are available. So we've reached out to the business places, employers, and said, okay, if you have a job or you, you need employers, let us know, and we would then be able to send people to you. So we, we act like, almost like, a, like a, a mediator, right? So anyone who has left school or who has, doesn't have a job, who would like to become gainfully employed, can go to the, minister, to the Department of Labor with his or her qualifications indicating, well, what their name, address, um, qualifications, what those are. The ministry, the department will have that information. And if, it's a, if the person, for example, is a mason or a hairdresser or a tailor, whatever, that information is there. And if, on the other hand, it becomes known from the employer's position that they, there are jobs available in these areas, then we match them. We act as an honest broker um, to get the persons to work where the work is and the, where the work is to get somebody to fill those vacancies. And, and that way, we people don't necessarily have to write application unless they are required. Right. We do the matching and we send the person, well, you go down to such a place because they said they want to work, or we send the reference and we get that done. If the employer, however, requires that the person writes an application, that is something that's a, that is outside of our profile. But we do tend to match the demand with the supply. Would you care to update the public on the long service gratuity and severance issue? Uh, the long, the um, severance, um, and redundancy, and severance pay. These are things which has been long established. I think we want to, people to understand the prescriptions of the law. That if one is made redundant, then one cannot, in under th three months, twelve weeks, find your employment. Otherwise, you cannot claim. We are not here saying that you must stay unemployed for 12 weeks. What we are saying is you cannot get your redundancy or severance pay if you find employment within that period. However, I believe that with the severance pay and that aspect of the labor um, market environment, that if, if we engage in the ongoing education of our people, and if with the government looking to attract the investment, to create the jobs, and we can match people with the jobs locally, that the issue of severance and so on will not arise except in very few cases. And that is what we are striving to accomplish. And the same thing with long service gratuity. Uh, with the long service gratuity, it is a, it's a different creature. Mm -hmm. Uh, what it is saying is if you've worked in a service industry, restaurant, hotel, things like that, for a period of 10 years, I think, you could, if you left that job, be entitled to long service. We are experiencing some, some issues with that because unlike the severance pay, which is fund or the... the, the source of funding for severance pay is a deduction, a contribution through Social Security into a fund which is there to meet that payment. If somebody is dismissed, there has been a contribution made on his behalf. That was at the protection of employment. 
But with the long service gratuity, there's no such provision. So it is largely an unfunded um, activity. So the government has to then put money out of the consolidated fund for to finance that. We are looking clearly at how we can refine that and, and, and to make it less of a of a immediate financial strain on the consolidated fund. Because if if people qualify in accordance with the law, you can't turn them down. But it's really a, 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 a a fund which has no actual funding except government transfers money from a different source. So we have to change that. Uh, my thing is is to say to both employers and employees, workers and those who hire the workers, if we are able, if you have good workers, keep them. If you have a good job, keep it. Because unless you are certain you can get another job. I will not resign from a job even if I've been there for 10, 20 years or 30 years. Once I, once you're still capable of doing the job, you should continue because you'll have a flow of income to help yourself. Some people jump, well, I want my long service graduate and then they can't find another job. And then they're scrambling to find another job to continue their quality of life. So, but I think we are this. We are looking at how we can refine it, the long service gratuity in process to make it something which we can feel good about and not see it as something that people can 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 extract money from. But when when we when we done the, the thinking about it, we will then communicate on that because we are we are coming to grips with it. Okay. So we we'll certainly look forward to having you back at that time. Any final comments that you'd like to leave us with before you leave, sir? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say, finally, and, um, uh, thank you for having me. But it's, it's good for us to have a, a, a better appreciation of what the Department of Labor does, and that it is not just a, a static department, that it has good ideas which it wants to help the economy or the people of, in the economy of St. Kitts and Nevis to appreciate their role, both as employers, creators of work, and those who take the work, that there can be a happy medium, a harmonious arrangement, and that there can be both benefited, mutual benefit, benefits for both, if we just have one goal. And what is the goal we want? Is greater productivity, greater prosperity for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. With the government providing the investment climate, with the government trying to put the services like health, education in place for people to develop themselves. We want our people to rise to the occasion and have the, the, the change in attitude which will enable them to perform their duties effectively, professionally. And that way, we can be an example for, for, the, for the region. Senior Minister and Minister of Labor, the Honorable Van Samy, thank you very much, sir, for meeting with us today.